Hello, and welcome to the Climate Restoration Policy and Advocacy Around the World segment of the fourth annual forum of the Foundation for Climate Restoration. Our solution-oriented focus and our drive to create the political will to implement those solutions is crucial to reaching our goal of bringing down CO2 levels to 300 parts per million by 2050. For me, that year is not just an abstract concept, since my grandchildren will be in their 30s at that time. The future is alive and well in their faces. Being a part of creating a movement and political will to ensure the basic quality of life for their generation is not just my passion, but it is the reason behind every meeting and action for all of us here at the Foundation for Climate Restoration. Assuring that tomorrow has an atmosphere with the legacy CO2 and greenhouse gases removed is a higher standard than the UN's IPCC work to report is a tall order but it is the safe and standard, safe and sane standard that is far more practical. And for me, it resonates with a, with a much more joyful future vision. Join us while we listen to our panelists focus on how we can move forward to reach these goals. Mike. Thanks, Terry. Uh, hi, I'm Mike Robinson. I run the Pacific Northwest chapter for the Foundation for Climate Restoration. And I'm here with uh, a group of panelists who um, also are active in advocacy in different places around the around the country and around the world. Um, we have uh, Tiffany House with us, who runs the chapter in Tempe, Arizona. Uh, we have Jay uh, Iyengar here. Um, Jay is volunteering to start the Texas chapter for the foundation. Uh, works for Deloitte Consulting and lives in the Dallas area. Uh, we have Chris Neidel, who is the co-founder of Open Air, which is a global volunteer action network uh, advancing CDR progress or uh, greenhouse gas removal progress through collaborative citizen science and advocacy initiatives. He's based currently in Austin, Texas. Uh, and we have Eli Mitchell Larson, who is chief science and advocacy officer and co-founder at Carbon Gap uh, and an associate at Oxford Net Zero based in Oxford, UK. Thank you all for being here. I'm gonna start, I guess, with Chris here. Open Air has uh, created and has been advocating for uh, a couple of different important uh, legislative actions, uh, LECLA and uh, CDRLA. Can you uh, explain for us what those are and uh, where we've gotten to, uh, or where Open Air has gotten those measures to? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thank you again for having me. Thrilled to be on the panel. Um, yeah, open air um, members uh, around the country now, around the world, uh, come together with a general policy idea, um, or they start with a place, be it a state or a nation or a city, and they think of ways in which CDR could be supported at that level and in that place. And we got started a few years ago uh, with the LECLA bill that you mentioned, which is the Low Embodied Carbon Concrete Leadership Act, like many people in the Foundation for Climate Restoration. Open Air is really excited about concrete as a potential uh, market in which to integrate different CDR technologies. Um, it's you know the most widely used material on the planet after water. Um, so we started in New York State with a state bill that was a general, created general incentives or a framework for uh, low carbon selection of concrete that's bought by the state, the state of New York as is in many cases in different states, is the single largest purchaser of concrete because of public infrastructure. Public sector is about 40% of purchases of concrete. So they can really change the way concrete more generally is made. And what we added to that was a, a focus, a special incentive for carbon utilization in concrete. So it's sort of a general low carbon concrete uh, procurement policy with a uh, CCUS, carbon capture utilization and storage component to it. And so that a version of that was passed and signed into law at the beginning of this year in New York State. Uh, and we have had versions of it, in various different shapes and forms that have spread to New Jersey, Virginia, Massachusetts and Illinois. And it also helped inform some of the federal uh, incentives that have been listed just in the most recent bill that passed. So it was an example of a bill starting in one place and then sort of adapting and spreading to other places through our members when the opportunity presented itself. And we're very close to getting a, an excellent version of it passed in New Jersey, hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, so that's LECLA. Uh, and then the Carbon Dioxide Removal Leadership Act, which we sort of jokingly called Strike for States when we started it, is really a procurement program for carbon dioxide removal, where you have states stepping in and creating early demand, not just for carbon removal, but carbon removal within certain parameters, in particular, 
selecting for carbon removal that's good at carbon removal, but maybe is good at local job production, is good at just transition, um, you know, that also scores for innovation. What are those forms of CDR that maybe have really, really high potential? And if, if that should be reflected in the, in the selection process. So that started in New York State again. We got two sponsors. And now I predict by January 1st, we'll probably have four versions of the CDRLA at the state level uh, in various different places. Uh, and then it also was partially the inspiration for a federal uh, piece of legislation currently on the Hill that was uh, has the same name. It's the Federal Carbon Dioxide Removal Leadership Act, very similar, was introduced by Paul Tonko in the House and um, uh, Chris Coons uh, in, in the Senate. So those are two of, I think now we're up to about seven bills, but um, really excited about that idea of us making the policy and then spreading it and adapting it through our membership wherever opportunities are present. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. Um, great work. And, and uh, we're here to support that effort uh, in each and every state where we have a chapter. Um, and then there's actually a lot of stuff happening uh, throughout Europe and the UK. Eli, can you chat a bit about that? Sure. Yes. Hi, and thank you so much as well for having me. We are uh, a new organization. We launched at COP26 and we're positioning ourselves to be the uh, basically prime advocate for carbon removal across Europe, uh, spanning all carbon removal methods, or I should say all climate restoration methods that involve uh, taking CO2 out of the air and upper ocean and storing it. And uh, there's, there's really quite a lot going on. I mean, I would say that we love Open Air Collective for their kind of bottom-up approach. And we try to take a complementary approach. And we actually partner with them. And I would say that, you know, Chris and his, his team and network have been instrumental, actually, in getting all kinds of kind of bottom-up policy initiatives going in a number of countries. And I'll let Chris talk about that. But our, our philosophy at Carbon Gap is to also kind of maintain a kind of house view of what are the core policy pillars that can get carbon removal to scale that are missing currently. So we kind of follow the life cycle of, of the climate solution, everything from the underlying source code, the certification and MRV principles that allow people to separate the good from the bad, the early stage funding for uh, CDR solutions that haven't yet actually been able to kind of exit the lab, exit the demo state and start to scale up. And then of course the deployment incentives piece. So I would say the things we're most excited about in Europe and most engaged on at the moment are number one, an initiative by the European Union to create a carbon removal certification mechanism, which is intended to be the kind of pan carbon removal method certification scheme that can put a big old European Union stamp of quality approval on good carbon removal. And, you know, we've seen before with this is kind of an idiosyncratic example, but the EU recently got Apple to get rid of their lightning port and go to a USB-C. So the power of, of European diktat in, in, in regulation is really, really big. And so we're, we're confident and hopeful that uh, if the certification mechanism is built as we hope it can be, and indeed brings in a lot of the wisdom and, and knowledge from around the world that's been gleaned on how to certify carbon removal and, and, I, and be honest about where the gaps are, we think it can be really, really powerful. And just as a segue to the um, portion of the panel later on about the Global South, that is a key element of Carbon Gap's mission as well. Although we're, although our sights are, are turned on European policy, we want to bring in the perspectives of the entire world, including, especially the Global South, because of course, uh, you know, a lot of these projects will be deployed outside of Europe. And so, the, the voices of communities that are going to be hosting these projects have to be kind of key and even central in the development of the methodologies that will basically allow the market to be built. Um, and then the only other piece I'll mention is uh, a, a project that actually uh, Chris and Open Air Collective are also working on as well, which is the United Kingdom is about to put in place deployment incentives, not too dissimilar from things like how the U.S. has 45Q or in the renewables world, many countries had feed-in tariffs or contracts for difference. So this will be a contract for difference for greenhouse gas removal. And there's still some questions about how exactly that policy will be deployed, and that's what we're consulting on at the moment. Uh, but suffice to say, we're really pushing to make sure that it's open to all forms of carbon removal that can deliver really high-quality storage. So it is focused on probably mostly offshore CO2 storage. There are other policies in place that 
that incentivize other types of climate restoration, like peatland restoration, soil carbon, et cetera. Um, but that's another piece that we're really excited about. So I'll, I'll wrap it up there. There's lots, lots more to share, and Chris might be able to comment on that as well. Um, so yeah, just to follow up and and sort of um, underscore what 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 Eli just mentioned, um, you know, there's the the generation of the policy, which, as I said, we we like to do that from a bottom up way. As this foundation for climate restoration, Jake Kelly uh, has been really key. Terry, many people, is real overlap there, both in the U.S. and in Europe. Um, but you know. We, we also acknowledge the importance of having, you know, subject experts and leaders that are really in the nitty gritty that also can kind of play the inside game, as we say, you know, that really, really are having those direct conversations with decision makers, both at the national and sub national level. And that's where Eli and his team at Carbon Gap really are just, you know, really ideal partners. So it's a really good combination. I think we have a good activist um, environment that's really forming globally that can also operate on a very local level. Um but yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of the, when we talk about the global South later on, the policy landscape, depending on where you are, will will be you know dramatically different. You know, we we look at you know the global North, for instance, is really where you would expect the demand creation and real supply side interventions as well to make sure that we can create a market for various forms of carbon dioxide removal and make those real investments in monitoring, reporting, and verification, or MRV. Uh, so important. We're only as good as our MRV, how well we can actually measure uh, if, if this is happening, both the removal and the storage. So we should expect a lot of policies that are geared towards that in some of the uh, northern economies. But as Eli said, some of the greatest carbon removal assets are, are in the South. Or they're distributed all over the world. And so we need to have a whole other policy regimes at the national and subnational level that create conducive environments for carbon dioxide removal uh, processes, but do it in a way that has very clear parameters around let's select for public good and not select for public bads, right? And so these are two kind of broad areas. And I'll end it on this, unlike with renewables, where there was sort of a history of good policy emerging almost randomly from certain places and almost by happenstance, then being handed off in a linear way over time from California to Australia to Japan to Germany to China, et cetera. What a network like this can do now is we're simultaneously talking to each other and constructing spillover between different places. So that something that's happening in the UK at the national level might influence something that's happening at the state level in Colorado. Uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> um, so th those are, I think that's a thing, a feature of the moment right now that we really have to capitalize on because I think that's the key to having these things happen fast is this sort of networked communication and collaboration. I'm, I'm really encouraged by what I'm seeing so far. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Eli. Um, I want to just underscore a couple of things that I heard uh, from you. Actually, uh, firstly, from Terry, uh, the fact that the idea of climate restoration and cleaning up our mess is a message of hope and action and how powerful that is. I find talking to people, um, people have a much better reaction to the idea of actually cleaning up our mess and making things better versus just making things less bad. <laughs> it's a much more optimistic message and it, to me it drives action and it drove me to action uh, to get involved in, you know, in advocacy. And then, um, you know, you guys talked about doing CDR on the Global South and I think one of the aspects of that hopeful nature of this situation is that we have a rare situation where we can see a multi-trillion dollar industry that has to get built over the next 10 or 20 years. And we have the opportunity to design some equity and justice into that, uh, that industry as it gets built. So that's a really rare opportunity. And um, I'm excited to see that you're talking about incorporating those values. Uh, and then just a couple of other uh, quick ones. Eli mentioned 45Q, which uh, for those not familiar is a tax incentive uh, in the United States to encourage carbon removal uh, and carbon sequestration. And huge change in the recent Inflation Reduction Act, that tax credit got increased to up to $180 per ton for CO2 removed from air and permanently stored. Uh, and the size of projects that qualify got reduced, and it is a uh, the way that the tax incentive uh, is structured is fully refundable. So huge progress, actually, that we're already making. 
Uh, and prior to that, in the investment uh, or in the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, uh, we Congress authorized uh, the Department of Energy to do these programs called Earth Shots, which are uh, you know like a moonshot. Let's get really focused on solving certain problems, and one of them is the carbon negative Earth Shot. So a lot of momentum, and we we really are seeing progress towards this vision of let's clean up the 1.5 trillion tons of greenhouse gas that we spill. Um, a key part of making that happen is, uh, as Chris said, local action and networking and grassroots efforts. And so I'm really happy that we have two of our chapter leads with us, uh, Jay and Tiffany. And Tiffany, let me ask you, could you just uh, um, share with us, uh, you know, your, a little bit about your journey, how you got connected to the idea of climate restoration and what you're up to in Arizona? Yeah, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, it's a joy to be here today. And uh, I guess it starts back in high school. I had an environmental science teacher who uh, just made me get so passionate about it. I went to college for environmental science and ended up getting caught up in the family business. So when I found out about the Foundation for Climate Restoration, I really got ignited. And to your point of having a positive influence, not feeling like we can't do anything about this, that it's an overlooming doom and gloom type of situation. So I just absolutely love the way of going about it with a positive mental thinking, going out and doing advocacy, coming together as people, working together for a common goal is really how we can make a difference with this. So with my chapter, it's not exactly where I want it to be yet, but that is so many things with life. Uh, but I really had the opportunity. I wanted to learn what else was going on in my community. So I reached out to ASU, Arizona State University, which is a leader in uh, the in environmental science, in uh, sustainability, and they have a new college called the College of Global Futures. And I was able to network with some of their uh, the, the people leading that organization and really had created some good connections. And I went to a Green Chamber of Commerce event and I met other good people and I'm working uh, with a smaller nonprofit to help them on their uh, their mission to get sustainability grad students to do an internship in actual uh, companies, local companies, where they can go in and uh, create a sustainability initiative and then implement that. So it has broadened my perspectives as I've been building out my uh, as I've been building out my group here in Arizona. So uh, I've really enjoyed all of it. And now I'm working with ASU to create the chapter actually on campus so that we will have sustainability graduate students and members of the community like myself all come together so that we can create uh, very powerful action. And in all of this, I got the chance to do a climate conscious leadership program at ASU. And it uh, really, they, in the end of it, you have to create your credo. And so I'm really passionate now about continuing the effort that I've made to build a really robust chapter. And uh, I am so lucky to have the support of Terry and the foundation uh, as I move along this journey. Thanks, Tiffany. That's fantastic. Keep it up. And Jay, uh, how are things going in Texas and how did you get uh, involved and decide to get active in setting up a chapter? Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, I was uh, introduced to this uh, Foundation for Climate Restoration, the, the book uh, uh, by P uh, Peter Fikowski, uh, by one of my friends on a WhatsApp group. And um, uh, just like anything, I just picked up the book. I had no idea. And uh, for the first time in so many years, uh, ever since I've been watching um, climate related news, uh, I have hope. I, I'm, I'm from India and uh, I'm, I grew up in a coastal town uh, called Alapi in southern um, India. And India has a lot of coastal areas, and it, it always used to really, um, uh, you know, bog me down uh, with the sea level rising and the, the, the climate, um, the, the temperature going up and all of that. And for the first time, there is some real solution that, that I'm willing to 
give up my free time, my weekends. I'm, I'm willing to call anyone. I'm going to willing to go and meet uh, folks. I've started uh, that activity here. Uh, all my um, uh, contacts know that what, what I'm doing. I have emails going out. I'm calling and talking to people. And uh, I bought a bunch of uh, the book and uh, anyone interested, I'm, I'm gifting it to them. Um, there are some uh, folks, uh, friends of mine who uh, volunteer at uh, places of worship like church and Hindu temples and all. They they want to uh, do something about this. They uh, And then uh, I'm, I'm mobilizing that. It's it's really uh, exciting for me. It's really uh, hopeful for me. Like uh, Tiffany said, it, it, some some real hope um, uh, to making a difference um, uh, by 2050, uh, 300 ppm. I'm it just uh, drilled into my head right now. I'm I'm going to just nonstop share uh, with people. And uh, we're picking up, and uh, Tom Rem from uh, Houston uh, is doing the same uh, out of Houston. He has a uh, big mailing list and he is uh, reaching out to people. So we are beginning to form this uh, chapter with the Telly Self, with all her tools, techniques, and templates and contacts. We're going to make uh, uh, this successful in, in, in Texas and uh, for the rest of the world. Yes, I'm so excited. Fantastic. Thank Thanks, Jay. Thanks very much. And I, I have to slip in a plug for the PNW chapter, uh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, we have uh, up here in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and we welcome folks from Alaska as well. Uh, so we have a group of uh, 300 plus uh, people up here who are all advocates of greenhouse gas removal. Um, and if you are interested in joining uh, any of our chapters, uh, you can visit foundationforclimaterestoration.org and there are some easy uh, buttons there to get involved. Uh, if you happen to be in the PNW, we have a meetup group as well. So you can visit uh, meetup.com slash PNW carbon removal and, uh, and join us in the effort. And since we're talking about local, I want to uh, circle back to policy because in addition to state and federal uh, actions, there are counties and cities that are getting involved in the act. And Essentially, if we could get every unit of government and every company to commit to removing, to get to net zero, yes, but also to removing their legacy emissions, we'd be a long way uh, towards climate restoration. And uh, Chris, can I have you uh, tell us a bit about the Four Corners Initiative? Yes, absolutely. And I, I could even proceed that a little bit. You know, first of all, just underscoring the importance of local government and not even just for the normal ways in which we sort of elevate the importance of local within environmental discourse or climate discourse, but really more about how every locality is an opportunity to try something new from a policy and development, uh, a project deployment perspective. They just, and particularly if we're talking to each other, like we said before, there's a lot of creativity that can happen if a conversation is actively constructed between local governments. And it's really been the cities and municipalities that have been the furthest ahead of embracing really ambitious climate goals and doing the math first and really trying to apply it where, where we all actually live. So that, that local should not be overlooked. And open air started with its first local focused policy in New York City, something called the um, Carbon City Property Tax Abatement Act. We use a lot of property tax abatements in New York City to incentivize batteries, renewables, and green roofs. So we have a currently introduced bill uh, in New York that would incentivize building integrated CDR uh, through a tax credit. So that was our first sort of flavor of uh, a focus on municipal. And then last summer, we connected with uh, Boulder County, Colorado and Flagstaff, Arizona, which were among a very small handful of local governments in the US that have formally embraced carbon removal as, as part of its overall uh, climate uh, mitigation strategy. And so while we were talking with them, we said there must be other places uh, around the country and around the world, local governments that similarly want to lead on this. But we also understand the constraints that local governments operate under in terms of their size and jurisdiction and authority. So the idea with Four Corners, which is in reference to the Four Corners states, was could we create a kind of an aggregated platform where different local governments in a common region or with a common interest in a form of CDR could team up together and co-fund innovative projects that wouldn't happen otherwise, but not only innovative, but also giving it really that local accountability stamp to make sure that we're really looking at what are the true impacts in real places if we implement this. And so we have our first 
uh, catalytic grant solicitation uh, that's going to kick off this month with Flagstaff, Boulder, and a couple of other Four Corners jurisdictions. Uh, but as Mike knows, the idea is, can we make that a persistent platform over time so that if you have you know a group in New England or in West Virginia or in the Pacific Northwest that want to get together and say, we have a particular idea around a particular kind of carbon dioxide removal, we can raise some catalytic funds to help make that happen. Um, I think it's so key to match with the higher level policies is to really have this active movement of novel local project creation that the world can then see. And then this gives people a real understanding of what are we even talking about when we're talking about CDR? Because as we know, there's still a sort of a, a, a narrow aperture imaginatively, I think, among the general public around what CDR can look like and be. And things like Four Corners are meant to sort of illustrate for people exactly what that could look like uh, now. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic example of, you know, how we can encourage action at every level of government uh, and put pressure on uh, companies as well to step up to get to net zero faster and to make the pledge to remove all their legacy emissions. Um, if uh, any of you are listening and you're thinking, um, well, I don't do this stuff, um, I didn't either, and Tiffany and Jay didn't either. So um, this is the issue of our times, and uh, we really need everybody uh, to get involved. And it's not difficult to get involved, um, to get a conversation going with your elected representatives at the local level or the state level, and that can have just a tremendous impact um, to get the ball rolling. And with that, I think I need to hand it back to Terry. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, for that panel discussion. It was very interesting to hear the bits of excitement from um, both Jay and Tiffany. And I really always appreciate hearing uh, Eli and Chris and their policy perspectives. I'd like to switch now to Paula, who's going to be um, leading our panel discussion on the Global South. Thank you, Paula. Thank you so much, Terry. Thank you everybody for this amazing conversation. And we're going to move forward to discuss the environmental issues in the global south. As we know, we need a combined efforts when it comes to fight climate change and to improve climate restoration. So I would like to first invite Marius Iraki Ziganira. He's founder and executive director of the organization Umoja Community Foundation. representative of the local yes, chapter of the foundation in Uganda. And posing the question, what is important to address climate change in the region, taking into consideration Global South's perspective. And after his introduction and his explanation, I'll pass to Tassa de Souza Santos, which is in turn of the Foundation for Climate Restoration. Marius, it's up to you. Thank you so much. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm also very grateful. Is a um, agronomy engineer and is a Congolese refugee. Is a graduate from one of the universities in DRC. Uh, as was said before, is the founder and the CEO of Moja Community Foundation, and we stay in Akiva, and that's where we operate from. Na ilo Moja na tumika pa na Akiva le kampi Uganda na tunafanya kazi ya kusensibilize na kumobilize ba tu na kubafundisha juu ya mulimo. And here we we major do um, agriculture work where we train farmers and we teach them new approaches about agriculture, especially regenerative agriculture. Na mwele regenerative agriculture, tunafundisha watu agriculture ya conservation kujia kutengeneza kudongo ya kuangalia kwa aplike manuveli teknike ya regenerative agriculture na tuko na engine approach tuko na ayu ni juya bajene juya nampa makulture. And specifically, we always always teach farmers about new practices and new techniques of agriculture and the soil health also engaging the youth about uh, permaculture um, science in order to increase the productivity of the land. 
na kufatana na ile tunashukuru sana kona Chris na kwa parce que tuko na galaxy project projet itakuwa projet pilote ya biashara mon niveau pa Uganda surtout pa mkae na Kivali na tuko na réfléchir juu ya kupanua na kuangaje ba agriculture ba mingi juu ya kuapliki na kulepatia mbuku dongo mboleo and see we are even lucky that see, we have Chris here with us because we have in a pilot project about voucher that see we are yet to start so that we can at least help farmers to to regain the fertility of their land and increase productivity so that we can protect our soil na mimi na participer kwa hii quatrième nani annuel ya global climate restoration we forum kwa kuwa si vrai du pena tourner ce processus ya ba limai aba ba réfugié agriculteur process dans ngou vuna yo na participer mon restauration climat na kupunguza carbone ni mon atmosphère and i'm so happy to be part of the fourth annual global climate restoration forum because it is an opportunity to show the whole world the effects and the impact that the refugees are doing in order to restore the climate protect So briefly, and out of 74 villages in Akivali, currently are working in nine villages, and we are still doing more sensitization and mobilization in order to teach and reach almost the majority of the farmers and train them about the new approach to agriculture and see how best we can protect our land and also protect our soil na kufatana na hiyo tulikuwa na programme ya leadership na kwa ile programme ya leadership tunasema juu ya ba jeune surtout ya social na kwa programme ya social ni programme mbili zinene na fasi moja kwa kuwa ku restore climat na il faut ku restore bichwa ya ba refugee du tunaishi muka na il faut ku restore le bichwa ba refugee du ni ba beneficiaire tuna ni ba limai sa kwa programme ya leadership na santé mentale ba limaliser le programme na ba jeune tout bon programme ya ku ba fondisha surtout tuna profiter tena ku ayi forum du ya ku angalia ku tafuta ba limunga monanga bo du ya ku fondisha ba jeune na ba limai ya and on the other hand we also have a part of uh, mental training session where we teach especially the farmers and even the youth about uh, the proper mental health strategies so that can at least clear their minds and uh, reduce some stress and traumas in their heads because all restoration work is humanitarian work and people have to be mentally fit so that can do the restoration work out of that we have completed the first part of uh, the first group in the training session and uh, we are taking to look for the more youth to train and it's also an opportunity that if if at all there's anyone who is experienced in that field please and you can become a trainer you can help us give us a contact so that whenever we organize this you can at least help us and you train this youth na kwa kumalizia tunaenda programme tunakuwa na hiyo ni programme ya seminaire iko international petit ma seminaire international tunaya partager na kuna kwa ni seminaire ya formation ya sensibilisation na mimi na shukuru tena kwa leo ku participer na mimi na shukuru wa responsable tout Terry na Jack c'est vrai mimi na forai sana ku participer na tanel ma seminaire tu na sifanya kana apa le 15 octobre mimi na wa informer ki tu na journée internationale ba femme rural na ba beneficiaire tu bana muke na bo e ba femme rural ba na tomika mo akivale na ndoma na mimi na shukuru na mimi na c'est marxant and the last I think we uh, lost the connection and now uh, we move forward then uh, we can make comments when uh, he returns and show and he showed the amazing work about empowerment of refugees who participate in climate restoration and energy transition and also taking into account the role of the youth in this area but i would like to also open for discussion the presentation of tasia santos thank you so much for being here we are eager to learn with you tasia thank you paula 
such an honor to be here with you all. I'd uh, like to say thanks to the Forum Organization for this opportunity to talk about and speak from a Brazilian, South American, and Global South perspectives on climate change and climate restoration. But first, I'll start talking about Global North because wealthy countries from the Global North have emitted around half of all emissions since the Industrial Revolution and have produced a carbon footprint 100 times bigger than that of the world poor nations combined which indicates that the least developed countries from the global south have contributed far less to global warming and also have had a least equal share in the benefits of fossil fuel use. At the national level, climate change intensifies within country inequalities by hitting hardest the poorest communities, including black, people of color, indigenous, as well as women and children. Global north and the global south face different realities, that mean different capacities, resources, and priorities on the political agenda. International climate change mitigation and restoration efforts would probably have been more vigorous if the nations around the world were more equal. While Global North has inclined to emphasize the common responsibilities of our countries to restore the climate and reduce emissions, the countries from the Global South tended to place more emphasis on differentiated responsibilities. Historically-based emissions reductions should be included in any climate agreement, as well as direct connections between climate change and sustainable development. Global North should endure most of commitments to reduce and remove emissions to incur the relative cost of addressing these transitions. Besides, the South should be compensated with aid to overcome additional challenges for not only adaptation and mitigation, but also climate restoration to combat climate change taking into account the ecological, historical, climate, and social deaths of the global north. Without adequate global action on climate change matters, South America is going to be one of the most affected regions in the world. It is necessary to actively include the voices and actors from the global south in the decision-making of global action on climate-related issues. And global north must support to more active inclusion of global south actors. There's still time for the world and Brazil to act and avoid climate change's worst consequences because a different future is still possible. To make sure that South America can overcome the climate challenges it currently faces, continued innovation and progress in decarbonization are essential, both in the South and the North, especially in high emission countries. Brazil, for instance, retains the potential to be a leader in a global transition to a climate resilient world based on its natural wealth. If it starts acting now, Brazil can create jobs, transform industry and strengthen economic resilience. Also, by opting for a transition to a climate resilient world, South American countries and sectors can have benefits, which come in the form of new industry, technologies and avoided costs of climate damages. Clean energy sectors could have rapid growth, and from 2016 onwards, South America could reach its turning point when the economic gains from decarbonization begin to outweigh the costs. And by 2070, the region can have 2 million more jobs. Protecting and forcing the Amazon will not only restore the world's vital carbon sink, but also sustain the most biodiverse ecosystem on the planet. Without the Amazon, there is no future because it is essential for maintaining global climate balance and the Earth's habitability in the short, medium, and long term. Unfortunately, deforestation in the Amazon grew 56% between 2019 and 2022 as consequences of the dismantling of environmental policy and increase in illegal practices such as land grabbing. Because of that, we are getting closer and closer to the Amazon inflection point, which is when there is no return for the forest. To reverse this scenario, we need to reforest, restore areas, and end deforestation. And this is why the Brazilian election this year is so important, because they are an opportunity to strengthen and resume policies that protect the forest and to rebuild the dismantling, bringing, and mismanagement of current environmental governance. Without the Amazon, the world's ability to restore the climate would be extremely difficult, and for that, it is necessary to strengthen the cooperation from global north to global south, without forgetting to address compensation for loss and damage.
climate restoration will generate important political, economic, social, and cultural gains that can be enjoyed by current and future generations by restoring our relationship with modern nature. Climate action will differ from country to country because there is no single strategy for the global south. Moving out of carbon requires addressing and revising our country-specific capacities, needs, and local contexts. Low emission countries from the south with more exposure to more vulnerabilities and global warming will need to focus on rapid adaptation, while larger emitter countries will have to concentrate their efforts on mitigation. Climate change can reverse decades of development. There must be a just transition away from a carbon-based economy to one based on the protection of human rights, sustainable development, and the principle that no one is left behind. That future can only be achieved in the context of the right to development and equity between global north and the south. It is also essential the assistance from the north to adapt to climate change, to build a climate resilient economy and for the South to become an equal partner in mitigating and removing greenhouse gas emissions. Restore our climate to how it was before the Industrial Revolution is a global imperative for us to deliver to current and future generations. Global North needs to pick up for its share and needs to pay for carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas removal in Global South. Thank you. Thank you so much for this brilliant presentation, Tasia. I, I was taking also notes about what you were talking about. As we see, uh, when it comes to environment without cooperation, there is no future. And as you mentioned, there is still a future to build together, but actually we have to act together, Global South and North South, in order to achieve its, this goal. Uh, the scenario is not the best one that we can imagine for now, but we can imagine a different future if we act now. And Amazon plays a huge role and also states have to introduce laws, but also to implement them to protect the environment and also find solutions. And this is also a combination of public sector, but also private sector. And uh, I would like to also take this moment to ask Christopher to jump in the conversation again, if possible, and talk about the BioChair project that Marius presented earlier. Christopher, please. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really kind of just trying to provide some um, guidance and connections. Uh, it really is Marius's vision and leadership uh, in the camp, which is incredibly Impressive. So hopefully he can speak to it in greater detail. But I think East Africa in general um, is just incredibly right, more so than I think most people in this space acknowledge for a range of different carbon dioxide removal interventions, those being both things like DAC and basalt uh, um, sequestration, because there's enormous geothermal resources in basalt, and just incredible entrepreneurship and um, within that region of the world that I've seen in, in other other aspects of my work and renewables. So there's a lot there. But Marius's project, um, you know, we're looking at uh, biochar using waste streams uh, within the camp. Um, but what's exciting is, is that as many folks who follow biochar, it's very difficult for sort of last mile communities in emerging markets to participate in biochar linked uh, carbon credits and monetiz monetization. It's very, very expensive to, to enter that at, at sort of even at the lowest level. And so there's a, I won't share the, the details of it yet, but they're, they're forthcoming. There's a really exciting group of researchers in uh, the UK who have developed a distributed monitoring system for biochar that we hope will allow us to validate or verify that biochar has actually been produ produced at a small scale. And so what Marius is doing in that community is already laid the ground of building awareness and a general acceptance around the idea of biochar from a direct benefit perspective. But if we can also uh, work with him and his, his colleagues within the camp to deploy just three biochar kilns, standard kilns with this technology, it's going to give us an opportunity to measure efficacy of that. And if that works and improves, that could open up uh, a whole other you know, sort of level of demand uh, for biochar in last mile economies, which I think is just extremely exciting. So, but again, Marius can really speak to the the rationale behind that and where we are with it. Thank you so much 
for jumping in again and explaining us a little bit more about the project. I, I believe that still Maris is still with uh, some problem with connection, but I would like to also invite uh, Jay and also Tasia with one more question, if I may. As a lot of been discussed on cooperation, but also education, when it talks about advocacy, we need to make people aware, but how to make people aware if they don't know what's the problem. So th there comes the education role in this regard and this amazing project that we are discussing here. But I'd like to first, Jay, and then after Tasia, what could we uh, see the role of the North, the North, the Global North in the education in this part of our mission here and when it comes to climate change? Is there a role that we can see the, from the the global north to the south when it comes to education, democracy, and change. Jay, if you uh, could join us, and then Tatsya again, please. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Paula, uh, for that question. Uh, so um, I, I have volunteered with the educational um, charitable organizations, and I'm, I also uh, want to take this opportunity to um, share with the other um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, volunteering organization. I'm, I volunteer with the uh, supply chain, um, uh, you know, North Texas uh, Epic Sub, uh, Association for Supply Chain Managers, um, and also uh, the uh, Project Management Professionals Association. The, so there are um, uh, activities uh, of education. Uh, we're we going to get uh, someone to come and present about um, the foundation's work uh, so far. And then j just getting the word out for for people is a good start, and also um, sharing specifically uh, the ac actionable uh, insights that we have developed over the uh, months, um, and, and share with the um, the larger group of um, you know, professionals uh, is one of my priorities in Texas. Thank you. Thank you so much, and, and I would like now to. As Tasia, the same question, uh, your view in this regard. Okay, uh, education is really important because that's how we can uh, teach people and that's how people can understand how to make some choices, like especially political choices, because policy is uh, really important uh, regarding climate. Uh, because that's how we can change uh, a country policies on climate related matters. So in a nutshell, this would be it. Thank you. Yes, that clarifies a lot. I think uh, we have the initiatives in the North and also in the global South, but it's a huge opportunity when it comes to exchanging knowledge and also technology and scientific research. As you mentioned in your presentation, Tasha, and I recall the a phrase of Michel Brichelet, uh, no one left behind. And it's also a human rights uh, phrase when it comes to enforcing and make it happen in human rights rights. And, and we have this discussion how to, how to implement them and how to implement to everybody and how to use this as a tool of development and not also suppressing other rights and imposing some kind of culture. When it comes to environment, is also in this part. We need a cooperation in all areas. And discovery is not my discovery or the other country's discovery. It's something that we have to share. And I would like also uh, to hear a little bit more of uh, Tiffany, because she presented uh, some initiatives that I think we could uh, know more about it and how we share this knowledge and improve and using the technology in our favor when it comes to climate. Yes, well, thank you so much, Paula. There is so much opportunity out there and really just looking to come together with people in our community and finding and creating good connections. Um, just by having some conversations with my friends about my engagement into the community, I was able to meet a, a city councilwoman and been working to make efforts with her and advocate with her. And uh, really it's about having good conversations with people that we care about, people that we don't care about, people, all people around us and not being uh, stifled by that at all. 
And it was really interesting when I got to do my climate conscious leadership program at Arizona State University. They really focused on the purposeful inquiry and the joyful revolution of what we can accomplish with the climate. And we had leaders on there from Microsoft and also from um, the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation. And really, they're, the it is out there. We just all need to come together and, and have the same conversations and get some of these um, awesome initiatives and bills and collaboration uh, together uh, to really make an impact on our climate. That's that's excellent. And uh, I believe that when it comes to environment and as a lawyer, we see that environment when, in terms of international development, it took too long to be in the international agenda. It's kind of recent if you think about the history of law. But uh, I believe that now is a very good moment to rethink how we're going to uh, cooperate and think new strategies. But also, I, I the, the, some points that I think I can connect, because it's also an area that I am very interested in, in the human impact when it comes to environmental violation. So we have not only the perspective of North and Global South, but when it comes to Global South, we have these uh, particularities like uh, environmental racism, the role of women, and how it impacts, for example, the vulnerable groups like indigenous people's rights and everything combined should be addressed in together and not separately. And I think now we are we're studying it in the past 10 years, kind of separately, these issues, and now we have to put it in, in together in one agenda to find better solutions and how we can restore our climate and how we can have this better future there we aim for. And that's why also we are together in this event. I would like to also again uh, thank you everybody for their participation and for ex explaining so well the, your role and how we can implement this and some ideas that will come up after this event. I'll pass now the word to Terry. Thank you, Paula and Sanmi and Safiti, who will bring us a perspective from Africa. Hi, everyone. I'm so really very honored to participate in the second time on behalf of Madagascar and uh, of Africa. Uh, uh, as we already know, climate injustice is a fact. And uh, we are currently experiencing now. And uh, the anthropogenic causes of climate change come from the North country. But it's a soft country pay the damage. And uh, this is aggravating the poverty that already exists, especially in Africa. However, the international scene works uh, on the principle balance of power and question of interest. And to be listened to, Africa must manage its forces well uh, in terms of uh, biodiversity and uh, natural resources. And it must imperative to sit at a level position uh, of uh, international or uh, intergovernmental organization. Talking about working together, so a force here is a better tool for the future to convey messages of a power country through the climate restoration. The companies of the North country must invest to support in the, uh, the, the partner, the organization in the South country. If we, power country, able to benefit from climate fund, the countries of North must be reduced the conditionality because the various criteria imposed always end and uh, it the rejection of the application phase and we know that african countries aren't able to meet uh, several uh, western criteria uh, given the level of development further impossible to access 
it and to bottom way return to benefit of North country. It's necessary to create one direction, one directorate in change of Africa within the e year. I'd like to give thanks for everyone who followed us during this forum. I hope that uh, this forum will be a new idea, new innovation for our future action. And uh, when we will uh, meet on the fifth, uh, the fifth forum, there is a big result. And I remember that climate restoration is a big and last issue for humanity. Thank you everyone. Hello everyone. It is good to be able to still join in the conversation around climate restoration. I would just like to maybe mention one or two points. And the first is talking in the light of the inclusiveness of young people in matters that pertain to climate action or climate change generally. It is no longer news that climate change poses one of the greatest threats of the century to our generation, especially to our livelihood. And um, this is very vital for us, right? Uh, especially for young, as, as young people, because we're talking about our future here. And uh, it is very important that young people are carried along in the manner in, in which policies are being driven because young people are the ones that are going to be impacted with several of the policies that are actually been put up out there so how come we don't find good number of young people represented in several of these decision making platforms it, it is so sad that this is happening but it is very important this is one beautiful message to our leaders that we need to include young people in several decision making platforms uh, thank god the united nations are beginning to do to do to do that but we still want more we're clamoring for more um the, the inclusiveness of say one fraction of one one out of ten or one out of hundred is still not enough we want to actually be able to represent the in fact if we talk about the majority it is not too much, it is not too much for us to ask because this is, this is going to impair our future. The aspect of government actually taking hold of uh, some of these policies that have been enacted, I will talk in the light of um, climate tax. Climate tax is actually a very good instrument that government can use. You know, this is going to generate revenue, definitely, because the amount of climate you emit into the atmosphere um, can interpret the amount of tax you're going to pay, uh, right? And if that happens, the government will begin to generate some good revenue from this. But we can utilize this in a very good way. It's going to be a lot um, difficult than just saying it. But then, if government will want to look into this, this is actually a very beautiful platform to be able to do that. So one thing is for government to generate revenue from this. Another thing is for government to utilize this revenue that is being generated from the climate tax to actually sponsor uh, several actions by youth organizations, by some large organizations that are putting forward actions that can mitigate this effect. Actually, in the times of when we're talking about restoration, there are several technologies now that are beginning to emanate. We're talking about growing mangroves, we're talking about doing um, removing the particular uh, um, content called kin in concrete and replacing it with um, ash and several, several other means that we're beginning to be, uh, that have been developed nowadays. Some of this Revenue that is generated from the climate tax can be put forward to be able to drive some of these new innovations and be able to at least um, push aside some of these older, say, technology or industrial actions that actually degenerate our atmosphere the more. Right? That's that's just one. There are ways that climate and the government can actually generate some good revenue. But if they are generating this revenue, they should also. Um, it should be well spelled out that any revenue generated from this and this type of activities should be diverted to actions that has to do with restoring the climate because it is very vital for us. You know, climate, it's done on us now that we actually have nowhere to go. But then it is very vital that we do this. Africa is the most heat um, when, we talk, when we're talking about uh, climate, climate effect. But then, when you're looking at the emission, uh, emission-wise, Africa is the is the least among the entire continent that, that emits 
um, climate um, climate degenerating gases into the atmosphere. If we're looking at it from this perspective, then um, it is important that the international organizations begin to look inward and begin begin to tax some of these heavy, um, will I say, countries now that generate so much into the atmosphere that is generating everybody, that is generating everybody's atmosphere. Let's put some good number of tax on them and use or utilize it to be able to offset the effect that what they are actually putting into the atmosphere is causing some of uh, the countries that are having the most impact from climate action. And this is very vital. Thank you for having uh, my inputs in the discussion around climate restoration. Thank you and God bless. Thank you both panels for um, our speakers and moderators from the Global South and Global North panels. We really appreciate what you had to say.